Oh, good afternoon. My name is Dave Bursky. Some of you may know me as uh, editor with Chip Design Magazine. And I've been in the trade press for about 42 years, which puts it about uh, 20 years before Flash became Flash. Now, uh, we have our keynote speaker coming up today, uh, Sean Walsh. He's the Vice President of Corporate Marketing at QLogic. He's uh, responsible for worldwide global marketing, OEM and channel marketing, industry alliances, and technical solution marketing. His major emphasis is on developing and driving markets for virtual LAN, WAN, and SAN technology for software-defined data centers. He was previously Senior VP of Marketing and Corporate Development at Emulex, where he managed strategic vision, established thought leadership programs and social media communities, completed new channel and government pro programs that captured considerable market share, created joint development programs with RSA and Cisco, Sourcefire, and managed the global marketing team. He's an active speaker and uh, contributed to various thought-provoking and visionary content on next generation cloud computing. He's over 30 years of experience in the storage and networking with companies such as Quantum, Overland Storage, JNI, STC, and Dot Hill. He holds a BS in management from Pepperdine. So with that, I'll have uh, Sean talk about uh, software-defined flash storage and uh, what applications it uh, helps improve. Sean? Ooh, this is just like my car. It has idiot lights. Stand here. All right. So um, let me start by apologizing right now. If you have not watched Game of Thrones, are not a fan of Star Wars, and you don't watch Mythbusters, this presentation will not make a lot of sense to you. So when I was asked to talk about this, I was like, OK, so I'm going to come to the Flash Memory Summit. I'm going to talk to people who are way smarter than I am. You guys know the technology far better than I do. And then the question became, well, what do you talk about? What do you say? And um, I worked with Frank Berry uh, at IT Brand Pulse on a lot of this because I wanted to try and do something that was much more of an end user perspective. And that's kind of where we started to go with this. So when you play the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. There is no middle ground. And I understand Joffrey Moore was here yesterday. And he wrote a book called The Gorilla Game that I absolutely love. Because what it talks about is in every market, there is an 800-pound gorilla. There's the chimp who cleans up the mess. And then there's a bunch of specialty monkeys. And that's kind of where we're at today. Depending upon your age, those could be the flying monkeys from The Wizard of Oz or the band from the 60s. And again, this is how you separate the generations of people. But when you think about what we're doing here, we are playing the Game of Thrones. We are at a point where we want to be that 800-pound gorilla. So there's a character in Game of Thrones called the Mountain. And the Mountain was the big 800-pound guy. And his job was to win in trial by combat. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. We are fighting and competing for that trial by combat. Now, one of the other facts that a number of people here don't know is that Many years ago, those of you who do know me, uh, I was about 450 pounds, and I was on the US sumo team. So I was not the mountain, I was the bubble, or big six, if you've watched, seen that movie. So when we talk about where are the heirs to the storage kingdom, well, guess what? If you make hardware for a living, it's going to get really tough. And yes, I work for a hardware company. <laughs> but the facts are is that we live in a world that is going to be software defined. And that means that what we're doing in the infrastructure has to be built from the beginning. And when we talk about what does that mean, it doesn't just mean taking what we've done and changing the PowerPoint presentation and slapping software defined on top of it. It means it's got to change at a fundamental architectural level. So on the system side, we're seeing that happen all over the place. Now, when you think about those elements, think about the elements that you're playing with today and which ones do people care about? Which one is going to survive? Who is going to be the winner at the end of the day? And that is the big question we have. So we've seen the big players take their shots at it. We've seen NetApp. We've seen EMC. We've seen Hitachi. These are the guys that own big chunks of the market. You've seen HP, who's probably the other one we should have put on here. And they are getting disrupted. 
And whether you like it or not, this is happening. Do not put your head in the sand. Do not pretend that this is not going to occur. It's going to be on an x86 box. It's going to be software defined. And it's going to change every six months as this film moves forward. And you have to have a hardware architecture that is programmable and extensible in order to do that. But ultimately, only one of these things are going to win out. So we know what's happening on the hardware defined storage. So, so hardware uh, controllers rule the day. They're still shipping in mass, and it's happening around the edges. So if you go to any of the hyperscale data centers today, whether, pick your favorite example, Facebook, Google, whatever, they are running software-based storage. If you look at what's happening with OpenStack, it's software-based storage. And if you look at what is happening in terms of virtualization, now there's still parts of the core enterprise that will be there for a very long time, but there's no question that that transition is going to occur. So where are we seeing that happening? Well, not a big surprise. Uh, Application-specific things that make some sense. Object-based storage is high on the list. For the block storage side, it's going to be the incorporation of RDMA that gives you very, very high performance on the x86 box and then allows you to transition your block storage off fiber channel and into these other areas. And yes, I'm a guy who makes half my revenue from fiber channel. So take it seriously when I tell you that that's at risk. Because we recognize that, and that's what we're preparing for as we go forward in this business. And then Flash. Um, there was a great survey that I saw, and it, it was a research report done at uh, Arizona State University. And it was talking about human interaction. And it made the comment that, <coughs> excuse me, that when you're having a conversation with someone, if I don't respond to you in about a quarter of a second, human beings start to lean in, they'll cock their heads, they'll look at you a little funny, hoping, or they'll repeat what they said, that they will, get, they, they will evoke a response from you. And when we talk about latency and we talk about flash, that's the whole point of this. Whether it is a specific in-order delivery for an application or the instantaneous response that we all expect when we hit send on a text, this is the purpose of flash. We tend to look at our technology, and we tend to get into the arguments of the technology. But what we want to do is change the game to understand that our job is to make things run faster, to make things more approachable, to make things more usable. And that, I think, is the magic of Flash. When you look at what it does, the instantaneous capabilities it creates, then you put software definition on top of it. And one of the things that Frank and I have talked about for a long time is that we see the enterprise market moving to the iTunes model. Is that if you look at what's going to happen in software defined, you will literally be able to say there is an app for that. And it's free. And you can go download it. And Flash is the thing that's going to make it run fast. So when we talk about what's driving this, well, it's real simple. Nature abhors a vacuum. Take your pick. Um, I had to go look up what a zettabyte was. Apparently, it's 10 to the 21st. Um, and when you look at what's happening, here's the perfect example. So I get on my phone. I say I want to download a movie. I process a credit card transaction in a block environment. According to our friends at Enterprise Strategy Group, that creates 36 copies of a 4K record. And then I have a 2 terabyte file that I'm watching. Okay. If you want to understand why flash is important, if you want to understand why this capacity is happening, that's why. There's no mystery to it. And it's going to continue to grow. So what are we going to see happen in terms of this transition? The big players, who will survive, who won't? You never know. But what we do know is that it will all be software defined. And the accelerating engine for software definition is flash. Without that, you don't have the ability to make this happen. If you look at the transition from Hadoop to Spark in terms of real-time analytics, that will be flash-driven. If you look at what's happening in terms of the way that people interact and expect that to happen. Um, when I worked at Quantum, though it hasn't been 42 years, but 22 years ago, we used to have a rule that 10 cents in cost savings was worth $10 million in engineering. At Google, they have a rule that 10 milliseconds in latency is worth $100 million 
and engineering. When you talk about why this technology is important to the world, those are the types of things that you're dealing with. Now, think about this on a global basis. Right now, there's roughly a billion users of technology um, in terms of the uh, web and internet. That's going to grow to three billion. If you want to triple the scale of what we've seen so far and figure that's going to double again in the next 20 years as populations grow and the density uh, and the penetration and capabilities go forward. Flash is going to play a critical role in bringing these solutions to the world. So when you talk about server-based infrastructures, app clusters are what you have today, the traditional data center. Unfortunately, like Tywin Lannister, they're going to get an arrow to the chest. When you look at the software-defined solutions, that's where things are going. And in the telco world, you're even seeing the same thing happen with network function virtualization. The telco guys are looking at this going, we're going to become dinosaurs and if we don't change. And at every single level inside the system, software definition, flash acceleration, generic hardware. So what's driving these things? Open source. Um, you know, we can pick any example that we want here, but the bottom line to this is that people expect everything that we're doing to be open. And if it isn't, then you start to run into challenges. That's what limits your growth. And I love this chart because it talks about what happens in terms of the simplicity of deploying software definition. Now, right now, I have to guess three years in advance to design an ASIC, get boards done, get them to customers, and then hope we're right. I don't know about you guys, but my prediction capabilities three years out is not very good. If it was like Joffrey Moore, I would have picked all the gorillas and I would not be standing here today. Software capabilities, build it, put it online, test it, and you're done. OpenStack releases new versions every six months. And that's the pace. That's what people are expecting. And as these software pieces come along, they expect them to then go from individual applications into Lego applications. The concept of a mashup. Think about that and what's been used in social media. People will start using that in next generation data center enterprises. And they expect them all to run instantaneously and Flash is the basis of that discussion. So when you look at what's happening, every single piece of the data center is going to change and every single piece of it is going to use Flash components. Because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once you accelerate one part of the data chain, the next part has to grow. Now, are the implementations going to be different? Of course they are. You'll have some DIM-based Flash. You'll have some of the things that are sitting on NVMe. You'll have stuff that's sitting inside, outside the box. But at every single level, it's going to be about finding the balance of caching and delivery based on Flash. So when we talk about how you do that, okay, this is very, very simple. You're going to take the open source stuff, you're going to take the high capacity storage pieces that are coming out, you're going to take all these form factors and you're going to fit them to the application. It's very simple, it's very straightforward, but it is the fundamental revolution that's happening inside the data centers. So S3 is a great example of this, okay. Think about what they're doing in terms of delivering very, very high performance stuff and doing flash based solutions that you can order online. I mean, there was a great survey done by Enterprise Strategy Group and they asked IT managers who were over 40 who were their most strategic partners. The top five were the big three server vendors, Oracle and Microsoft. When they asked IT managers, under 35, who their most strategic partner was, there was one answer, AWS. And AWS is going to bring flash to everybody. This is when we talk about the change, when we talk about how rapidly you can deploy things differently, and that you expect the application to perform rapidly when it's deployed. This is why flash is so critical in these software-defined data centers. So. Clearly, there will be multiple tiers of this. There'll be the hottest tier, and that'll be on your DIMMs, it'll be running in memory, and that sort of thing. But 
you got to synchronize those applications across systems. You got to get data in and out of those boxes. You got to make sure that it is protected and that it is redundant. We won't call it backup anymore because we don't do backup anymore. That's, that's, that's one of the things we pretend that didn't happen. Um, I remember when I got in this business in 83, they said tape was going to die, and I think they're still doing a billion dollars a year in it, but we'll save that for another day. Um, but look at what's changing. Cold data. This is the new tier. This is data that never goes away. So just remember this. If you post it, your kids will find it forever. Your grandchildren will find it forever. I, I believe in the system that, th that there is no longer ignorance, or excuse me, there is no longer privacy, there is just delayed ignorance in whether they choose to look. <laughs> so I have a number of things I'm hoping that a s several data centers crash in the future. What can I say? I thought I was cute at one point. All right. So what's going to change? Well, in addition to software definition and, and adding Flash, is the tools are changing. So the ability to partition your I.O. communications, the ability to use RDMA for putting stuff directly in and out of servers, the ability to virtualize the card and make that both network, or excuse me, both physical and virtual functions. We talk about enabling a software-defined data center. You have to have technology that understands it's going to be used in that software-defined way. And that's probably the biggest change in focus for us as a provider of technologies into this space. So when we look at it, we have to understand the different changes so that we have to be able to create private communications across any set of servers, across any distance. And in order to do that, you need Flash in order to make those things happen. If you want your Flash to run fast, you've got to have RDMA because you've got to get stuff in and out of those systems, and we can do that. And you want to have higher performance bandwidth. So uh, Netflix is a great example. Today, Netflix, their content distribution systems that they're running on are on 40 gig. And they want 100, and they want it now. They would actually prefer 400 if we could give it to them. <laughs> yeah, I know. You, you think about that, and you go, the fastest technology in the world is being used to watch reruns of Ren and Stimpy. Well, take your pick. But when you talk about the things that are happening, um, the 100 gig technology is moving very, very rapidly, and it is designed again. Why? Because every other element inside the system is being accelerated with flash. And as flash gets faster, the network has to get faster, and the network has to understand the software defin definition pieces. And as we look at flash, that's why we're here as a networking company, because we recognize that this, more than anything else, is going to change the dynamics of how people use networking. So as you roll this film forward, not a big surprise. You're seeing the traditional enterprise storage market on-premise moved off-site, and the latency and all the other issues are not the issue anymore because the applications are running there. Okay, An interesting dynamic occurred at QLogic. Um, our CEO uh, came from EMC, and one of the things that we were trying to do as we were developing sol solutions was we want to talk about end-user solutions. Okay, let's face it, we are way down the food chain with a lot of the stuff that are, is in the exhibit hall here. And you got to get that up level to people. So we did something that we thought was fairly innovative. We actually took our technical marketing team and got rid of them out of marketing and sales. And we moved them into the CIO's office and said, we will only write case studies and use cases around technology that we use. And when you start to do that, it changes your perspective quite a bit about how your products are used. You know, the proverbial eating your own dog food. And this chart came from that. Because when you talk about it, you don't worry about it on-premise because the applications don't run there anymore. And when you start looking at the things that you want to do with software definition, it accelerates your acceptance of this and it changes the way in which you look at it. And yes, it's a long curve, but it is definitely going to be there. So. We've been using this phrase, 25 is the new 10. Why is that? Well, it's very simple. It's a single high-speed line, cheap cable complex, 
and it's built for RDMA capabilities, NVMe, and, acceler and accelerating network performance to match what's happening with Flash. And again, everything that we do in networks is we are at best a contributor to what goes on, okay? We are an enabling technology. We are not the, the center point of this. And that's why when we look at Flash, we go, we have to move faster than you guys are ahead of the pipe. So that's the end of the proverbial prepared remarks. If you guys have any questions, let me know. And if not, please make something up. I look really silly just standing here for the next five minutes. <laughs> yes? Okay. So the question is, as a company that makes connectivity, uh, where do we think things are going to change as we go forward? So um, number one is, you know, let's be candid. They're moving off fiber. They're going to Ethernet-based storage. So that's a given. But I think the biggest transition is going to happen with NVMe is it's going to be the change inside the server architecture that changes where it goes. And then we have to look at the different ways that things are fed interprocessor communication, and in a lot of ways this is going to look a lot more InfiniBand-like in that sense going forward than it is the classic fiber channel iSCSI NAS. Um, so from our end of it, uh, we look at it and say, okay, if you look at hyperconverged infrastructures, the number of connection points are going to change, but they have to be, I, 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 I'm loath to use the term smarter or more intelligent because, you know, we, we beat those phrases to death. But they have to understand that the nature of what they're transporting is not just storage or not just IP, that there's going to be different types of connections, and there will be things that are fabric-driven, there will be things that are point-to-point -point driven, and that the personality of how it operates has to be dictated by these software-defined terms. Um, I would tell you right now, you know, we know that you know, over the next three years, the 25, 50, 100 gig transition is going to happen. We know that NVMe is going to happen. Uh, the good news is Intel doesn't seem to have a play in the 25 gig space. So it's going to be us and Mellanox and uh, Broadcom slash Avago slash whatever they have acquired uh, put together. Uh, and beyond that, I can tell you that there are a series of other uh, IPC-like interconnects that are going to occur and that we're going to have to evolve that in order to be a viable player going forward. Okay. I have read all, all the Game of Thrones books, so if you have questions about the series, I can take a shot at that too. <laughs> yes? So let's, let's, let's talk about that, because that, that's, that's a great question. Uh, to me, it's a lot like hybrid cars. So um, I was uh, talking to Samay at Del Oro Group, and uh, one of the things we were chatting about for our own internal planning, oops, sorry about that, um, was where are servers? So last year, she was predicting that hyperscale shipments into the cloud MSP area would exceed enterprise server shipments in 2019. This year, she moved it to 2017. So the irony is hyperscale next year will be mainstream. I mean, it will be the definition of mainstream, and enterprise will be the anomaly, which I find kind of interesting. OK. One more back there. Where'd they go? Ah, yes. Hey. So that was one of the age-old questions for the RAID business for, for many, many years, is you eventually concentrate so much in there, and then they started to distribute it, and what are the various pieces to that? So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go way out of the box on this answer, OK? Um, I actually think that, that as we move forward, the, the fundamental architectural things that people are doing in hyperscale have inherent redundancy built in. So I think that, there, that that will be the answer to it. It'll be much more cluster type solutions. If you look at what's happening with some of the early advances in quantum computing, and you look at how that helps address density, if you look at what's happening with some of the shingle overlap rights 
on hard disk drives in order to increase density. If you look at what's happening with some of the three-dimensional storage technology that's coming along that hits with optics on multiple colors of lights and basically takes, his d takes dense wave divisional multiplexing and applies it to storage. I think what we're going to see is that because we have in the hyperscale a trashable hardware model, that what we're going to see is that that architecture will grow more, free, uh, more predominantly and yes, there will be incredible densities of things, but I think it's going to be more inherently replicated and that those pieces, those subcomponents, will start to add more redundancy inside them uh, as part of that. So, I don't know if that's a great answer, but I think that it's going to, you know, we, we come to this precipice uh, multiple times throughout history and the two things that seem to solve the problem are distribution and disaggregation, and then improve improvements in density and footprint inside those disaggregated components. So my bet right now is that will be the approach that continues to have success in the future. So I know that's probably not the most satisfactory answer, but it's the best one I got to that question. Um, and, and I think that's, that's an interesting point is that, you know, uh, the early enterprise was all about building systems that had in, uh, incredible inherent levels of redundancy to what I call the recycle economy. They want to be able to throw in a, uh, any widget, use it for a period of time, and if it fails, to your point, they've designed the system so that the failure of those components isn't catastrophic to it. Um, you know, and history has shown we do really well for a period of time, and then nature teaches us otherwise, so hopefully, we will, we will learn from our previous mistakes. One more. Yes. Is John Snow really dead? John Snow is not really dead. He's coming back. <laughs> Except he'll have blue eyes this time. <laughs> okay, with that, uh, I think we're just about out of time. Thank you. I want to thank you very much.